From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Sergeant Barney Peters, Fort Morris Police. Oh, hi, Sergeant. Thought you and Adam Bowles were coming over here to look at the evidence in the murder of Ricardo Amarigo. We are. Ed's out warming up his plane. That's why I answered his phone. We got a visitor here in Port Morris. Who? The guy Ed thinks did the job. Pete Corbin, Amarigo's booking agent? That's right. In Port Morris? That's right. Well, are you holding him? I can't. No legal reason to, in spite of Ed's suspicions. Well, what's Corbin doing there? I don't know, unless Ed's right about him. Huh? And Pete knows you're on his trail. Well, what's that mean? It could mean he's down here gunning for you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Port Morris, New Jersey. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Item three, one dollar even. For whatever it was, the local druggist recommended to pull my stomach back together after the flight in Ad Bull's private plane from Ad's farm in South Vineland to Port Morris. In a sense, I'm glad we flew. In a car with Ed at the wheel, we'd have been all over the road. As it was, we were only all over the sky. Oh, beautiful day for flying, isn't it, Johnny? Can't you hold a straight course, Ed? What's the matter with this ship? Well, not a thing. I like to weave around a bit. I like the feel of it. You know, all that power under you. Yeah. Sure you're not just trying to scare me into welching on our little bet? I'm going to win that bet, Johnny. Your commission on the case, plus all that goes on that well-padded expense account of yours. You just get busy and find the body. Why don't you forget your dark past as a private eye and stay retired? What? And leave an old friend like you floundering around with a case that's... Hey! Clear cut. You don't watch your steering. We'll be floundering around in those salt marshes down there. Sorry. But can't you see, Johnny? Pete Corbin, Amerigo's agent, has to be the heavy. He's the beneficiary of Amerigo's policy. Amerigo owed him a lot of money. Too easy. And Pete's the only person we know of who was with Amerigo constantly. You got motive, opportunity. Too easy, I tell you. But I wonder what under the sun Pete's doing in Port Morris. Ah, that we'll be finding out. We'll land there in a couple of minutes now. The little town of Port Morris was set on the edge of one of the wide salt marshes that border a lot of the South Jersey shore. Just a vast expanse of salt hay indented with little coves and inlets. Soggy, swampy country. Ideal breeding place for the famous Jersey mosquitoes. And I guess for me, the ideal breeding place for trouble. Sergeant Barney Peters met us at the mucky little landing strip just outside town. And we headed out on a narrow, muddy road across the marshes. Yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. If I were you, I'd try to pin down this Corbin. Well, where is he now? Back in town. Got Alf McCracken keeping an eye on him. Alf's a boy you saw Amerigo crash through the bridge that night, you know. Barney, I still wish you'd cooked up something to hold him. But what, Ed? Sure, Ed. Every bit of evidence you think you've got on Corbin is purely circumstantial. What else have you got to go on, John Boy? Oh, we'll see. We'll see. After I have a look at the bridge Amerigo busted through in his car. It's just up ahead a bit. Crosses the Lucky Hill Creek. I'd also like to know who could have... Well, I'd like to know what could have happened to his body, to that $30,000 Amati violin. You'll see. Just keep in mind that there's a mighty big flow of water in the creek from the tide coming in and going out. Hmm. Tell me, Sergeant. Johnny, I checked it. Huh? Tide had just turned, was on its way out to the ocean at the time Amerigo's car went over the bridge. Right, Barney? That's correct, Ed. Right now, though, it's probably about as low as it'll... Whoa! What's the matter? Just pulling over to let this car that's coming pass us. Otherwise, one of us might shear off into the swamp. Yeah, these roads weren't meant for two-way traffic. Darn fool's coming pretty fast for a road like this. He isn't careful. Hey, look, Pennsylvania plates. Huh? He's right. That's Corbin's car. Corbin, huh? Swing across the road, block him. Wait! Son of a gun. Well, now, where's Corbin, all right? Well, then swing around. Go after him. On this road? He'd slide off into the swamp so fast... By the time we go on up to the bridge and turn, he'll be halfway back to Philadelphia, blast him. Well, we had the bird in hand and didn't know it. What are you going to do now, Johnny? Just exactly what we started out to You're do. losing valuable time. Now, if I were still oh, in this... Oh, Ed, racket... why don't you stay retired? 
We drove slowly on up to the bridge, stopped and got out. And although the tide was almost low now, it was easy to see how that rush of water would easily carry a violin or a body or most anything right out to sea. Or could it? The tide was running this same way when it happened. Out. Yeah. And the current was a lot stronger than it is now, so you can imagine what it would... Huh? Yeah. What's the matter, Johnny? Well, that, uh... That big bird nest, whatever it is, down there at the side of the creek, 50, 60 feet. Oh, that's just where the reeds and hay got matted up. It does look like... Hey. Yeah. If that isn't a fiddle case propped up on top of it... Sure looks like sure one. Sure it is. Sure. The tide was higher then. The fiddle stuck in those reeds. Wait here. Well, now, Johnny, don't. You come back here. Dollar! Dollar's like quicksand. Stay out of it! Well, you darn fool! It was come like quicksand, too. You'll never make it! Black, glowy muck. And I sank into it up to my knees. I almost had to swim through it, hanging onto it, pulling myself along by the reeds and pull rushes. But half of this case hung on that $30,000 Amati violin, and I wasn't going to let it slip out of my hands. A couple of times I dropped into soft holes, almost up to my shoulders, but somehow I kept going. Pulled the fiddle case off the pile of matted weeds and started back. But it used up most of my strength. With only one hand to pull, to pull myself along to... Ed! Ed! Johnny! Johnny, try and grab this rope! Here! Can't! Breach! Try it again, Ed. Drag it back. Try it again. Johnny, use the violin case. It'll keep you afloat. I... I'll try. You all right, Dollar? Dollar! Here, Johnny! The rope again! I hadn't passed out. So help me, I hadn't. Not entirely, that is. Or I'd never have been able to grab the line that Ad Bowles threw to me. Needless to say, I took a lot of kidding from Ad and Barney Peters on the drive back to Fort Morris... Especially since I didn't really know what had happened until I came to in the back seat of the car clutching the fiddle case. Jerk. If you'd held on to the rope with the death grip you have on that violin case, we'd have got you out of that muck before you swallowed half the salt water in that inlet. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll say this for you, Mr. Dollar. You don't give up easy. The fiddle. The $30,000 Amati. At least I had half of this miserable case in hand in my hands. There'd be no insurance collection on that violin. And I saw it. Well, what's the matter, Johnny? You passed out again? No. No, Ed. You should have cleaned me up before you piled me into this car. What? Look. Well, what is it? Piece of shirt. Ricardo Amerigo's shirt. Is that? Yeah, look. Monogram on the pocket, R.A. And what looks like bloodstains. Hey, you're right. Where'd you get that? I must have picked it up when I picked up the fiddle. Well, at least it proves that Amerigo went down with his car. No doubt of it. What I didn't tell him was that the piece of cloth from Ricardo Amerigo's shirt was fastened to the violin case. Deliberately put there. But by whom? By Pete Corbin, Johnny. That's your man. Are you listening? Yeah, I'm listening. Beneficiary, confidant, caretaker of both Ricky Amerigo and his car. Who else could have sawed through the steering bar that made the car run off the bridge? And a guy who was smart enough to have it happen in this godforsaken salt marsh. Now, just a minute, Ed. Okay, Barney, in the heart of sunny southern Jersey, where he expected nobody'd find car or body or even the fiddle until long after the insurance claim was met. Thanks to a tide that'd carry everything out to sea. For indeed, my friend, if your deputy, Alf McCracken, hadn't actually seen Amerigo's car slip through the bridge rail... It... Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. If Pete Corbin had planned this whole thing, he would have made sure the corpus delecti would be found. Johnny, that's why he had the accident happen where somebody saw it. Yet that somebody, Alf McCracken, didn't see the fiddle float away, didn't see the body float away from the car. Oh, stop it, John, boy. You know as well as I do that this whole thing was engineered by Corbin. All right, tell me, investigator, what was he doing down here today? Well, Lord knows, and I don't care. Probably to plant that piece of shirt. Johnny... I've given you all the help I'm going on this case. From now on, you either follow my tip and lose your bet to me, or you don't and give yourself a black eye with insurance company. Johnny. Oh, yeah, Barney. Ed's a good detective. He 
he'd have to be to retire on that nice farm of his over in South Vineland. He even broke a burglary case for me once here in Port Morris a couple of years ago, when I couldn't break myself. Ah, pastime. But you've got guts. I like you for it. Thanks a lot. And to me, the Pete Corbin theory looks, well, too easy. Oh, not you, Barney. That's what I've been trying to preach to that stubborn egghead sitting beside you. I'll lend you a suit of clean clothes, and you can chase this thing down the way you want to, without the dubious help of somebody who's just trying to win a bet from you. Traitor. And if I were you, I'd hunt up a few other people who knew Ricky Amerigo besides his press agent, Pete Corbin. You are a mind reader. Gentlemen, I have only one thing to say. And, Johnny, it's addressed to you. When you finally find that Pete Corbin done it, you know where to send the check to me. At Port Morris, we learned that Alf McCracken had lost track of Corbin when the former dropped in at Osborne's Oyster House for a dozen and a half show. Hadn't even seen him take off in his car, much less leave in a hurry after spotting us on the road to Lucky Hole Creek. I took advantage of Barney's offer, borrowed a suit of his clothes, and accepted a ride from him to the crossroads of Woodvine where I could get a bus back to Philadelphia. Sure, half my job was done. I'd recovered the $30,000 Amati violin. But I could still hear the oh-so-pleasant voice of Ad Bowles, ex-investigator, not so retired. You know where to send the check to me, Johnny boy. Expense account item five, $4.95. Bus fare from Woodvine to Philadelphia. And believe me, it's a long bus ride. As soon as I got to my hotel and changed into my own clothes, I called Harry Branson at the insurance company. Mr. Branson here. This is Mr. Dollar, Mr. Branson. Yes, Mr. Uh, John. Yeah, I'm back at my hotel, music lover. And I've just won the $30,000 Amati. What? Yeah, I got the fiddle for you. Well, thank heaven you recovered it. Uh, what of Ricardo Amerigo? Uh, later. Do you want the Amati? I'll be right over. Where is it, John? Where is it? Right here, Harry. Right here. Case, bow, and all. Oh, thank heaven. And by some miracle, it's dry as a bone and all in one piece. Voila. Oh, thank heaven. John. John? What's the matter? This? An Amati? Oh, no. Oh, no. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the results of a poker game. And believe me, there are times when the cards can be really stacked against you. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Sam Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>